24th lecture in Professor T. Ramachandran lecture series. I request Professor Jagannath Nai to kindly escort the dignitaries to the dais. To introduce the dignitaries, I begin with Professor Uday Kumar Yaragati, Director in Charge and Students Welfare Team, and our Chief Guest Professor S. Subramanian, Professor, Department of Materials Engineering, IISC. And Professor Jagannath Nayak. I guess he 
He needs to, no introduction to this particular audience. He is a professor in the Department of Electrical and Electronics Engineering. He is one of the very active faculty members of the institute, participating in all activities, always with a leading role. Most of the activities in this institute are organized by him, especially when the government order comes to organize an event on the next day, we will all look at Professor Yaragati and because of him, we could organize, for example, this year's Swachata Andolan or Unity Run or any such programs with a very, very short notice and of course this year's convocation which is also held out, uh, I mean, not in Sivaraj Auditorium, the pendor, all the seating arrangements, everything was taken care by him. So, he always takes the leading role in all the activities of the department and being a well-wisher of our department and also an admirer of Professor T. Ramachandran, he has kindly agreed to preside over this function and I take this opportunity to welcome him on behalf of all of you. I also welcome our former colleagues and my gurus, uh, Professor Sudhakar Naik, Professor uh, Kailbert, Professor Hebbar, Professor uh, Prem Kumar and Professor Prasad Rao. Also wish to welcome uh, Mr. Suresh Bhatt, uh, Professor Prem Kumar uh, and of course invitees, guests, welcome you to this function. At this juncture, let me briefly tell you about the genesis of this particular lecture series. Professor T. Ramchandran joined the NITK, the then KREC, as a professor and head of Department of Metallurgy in the year 1965 and served until his superannuation in the year 1989. Towards the end of his tenure in our institute, he has also served as the principal of the then KREC for two years. Professor Ramchandran, along with his colleagues, has built our department brick by brick and today it may not be an exaggeration if I say that our department is one of the best departments in this institute. May it, may it be academics, may it be research, may it be student-faculty interaction or interpersonal relations among the faculty and the entire credit for all this goes to Professor Ramachandran who has set this trend. He is instrumental in developing the infrastructure and sound basis for research in our department. To his credit, actually, he was honored by the Department of Metallurgy, Banaras Hindu University, with the Distinguished Animus Award in the year 1973. During 1975, 76, 1983, 84, and in 1990, after his retirement, he was the visiting scientist at Max Planck Institute of, for Ferris Research at Düsseldorf, Germany, from where he had obtained his doctoral degree earlier. In his appreciation, in appreciation of his immense contribution to the Department of Metallurgy at NITK, the department had organized a national seminar, Metmats 89, to coincide his superannuation in the year 1989. His ex-colleagues and students have donated generously for the event and the idea of starting this lecture series was originated during that time. From the excess money available from this event along with the contribution from his well-wishers, a fund was established for the very purpose and the fund is now being managed by the institute and the interest earned from this fund is being utilized for meeting the expenses of the lecture every year. We are thankful to Professor V. Ramachandran, Metallurgical Consultant of USA, who, has, who had mobilized funds by contacting the alumni of the department settled in USA. We are also thankful to Mr. Nagprakash Babu, a distinguished alumni of our department, who had donated 10,000 US dollars to sustain this lecture series. We also thank all the contributors. The names of the contributors are available in the lecture notes which will be available in e-form soon. Our chief guest, Professor Subramanian, will be shortly delivering the lecture on microbially assisted process in mineral processing and environmental remediation. And I take this opportunity to give a very brief introduction of our chief guest, Professor S. Subramanian. Professor Subramanian obtained his master's degree from the University of Roorkee, IIT presently IIT Roorkee, and his PhD degree in metallurgical engineering from the University of Mysore, 
working at the then TREC, Karnataka Regional Engineering College, Suratkal, on a CSIR fellowship. Dr. Subramanian joined the Department of Materials Engineering, Indian Institute of Science, Bengaluru, in 1984, where he is currently a professor and co-chairman of Indo-French Cell for Water Sciences. Professor Subramanian has carried out postdoctoral research at the University of British Columbia, Canada, and was a visiting scientist at the Lulia Institute of Technology, Lulia, Sweden. He has more than 150, 150 publications to his credit and has co-edited five books and two special issues of journals. He is a member of editorial board of Mineral Processing and Extractive Metallurgy Journal brought out by Institute of Mining and Metallurgy, UK, and Australian Institute of Mining Metallurgy. He is also the editor of Transactions of Indian Institute of Metals. He is a recipient of Mineral Beneficiation Award of the Indian Institute of Mineral Engineers in the year 2006 and was elected as a Fellow of Indian Institute of Metals in 2009. His research interests are minerals and bioprocessing, surface and colloid chemistry including environmental issues. With this, I conclude my introductory remarks and I welcome you all one again. Thank you, sir. I take the honor to invite Professor T. Ramachandran to address the gathering. My ex colleagues and friends, uh, members of the Metallurgical Engineering Association, ladies and gentlemen. I am no longer in a position to speak extempore, of course, I was never able to, so I'll read it out for you. First of all, as I have been saying all these years, it is a matter of joy and privilege to come here once again. And I wish to thank the Metallurgical Engineering Association and the Department of Metallurgy and Material Science, Metallurgical Engineering and Materials Engineering for giving me this opportunity. Of course, I will be failing in my duty if I do not mention the whole idea of this lecture series. I hope to uh, some of my ex-colleagues and friends uh, and they have contributed immensely to the organization and success of uh, this meeting every year. I am particularly happy that we have Professor Subramanian who was one of the earliest, perhaps the earliest doctoral student in the department to give this lecture this year. I know he was given very short notice and we are all very happy he could still make it. It was very much, I was very much involved with, uh, with him during his uh, time with us, though not perhaps in scientific matters. Personally, I had to, I had a lot of interactions with him. He had some difficult times during his uh, PhD work here. Uh, yeah, it was necessary to support him morally, which I have done, I think. He did some pioneering work here along with Dr. Natarajan and has been distinguishing himself at the Indian Institute of Science over the past decades. Thank you, Dr. Subramanian, for accepting the invitation of the organizers of this lecture. I have to also emphasize one point. When Dr. Subramanian started his work here, or earlier Dr. Natarajan started his work on bacterial leaching, there was no educational institution laboratory doing such work. So it was really pioneering work that was started. Uh, I, don't, I don't think there was any scientific work going on in this field anywhere in India at that time. Maybe National Metallurgical Laboratory or somewhere, I don't know. But at that time, this was probably the first lab which started this work on a scientific basis. And uh, of course, all credit goes to Dr. Natarajan and all of us that was to support him here. And of course, he later distinguished himself again after going out from here also in the Indian Institute of Science. In one respect, oh, I have to mention one more, one more thing. Like, 
Now, my daughter and sons will be the most happy if I tell them that the daughter Yaragatti uh, is, was the acting director today and also uh, presided over this meeting. So they were all closely, uh, close friends and I'm sure they will be very happy to know. And, uh, In, in one respect, this year's lecture is a somewhat of a sequel to last year's lecture by Dr. V. Ramachandran on the process metallurgy of base metals. The irony is that process metallurgy, process metallurgy as a discipline is fast disappearing from metallurgical engineering departments in our country. In spite of the high relevance of the field to our country, we are all following other countries where probably there is no extractive metallurgy at all. And, uh, but actually here, there is a lot of relevance for this field. We look forward to an interesting lecture from Dr. Subramanian on a subject that this department of all teaching institutes in our have already said that, but they must first to start work on. For what follows, I do not claim the original authorship. But I found this so interesting, I want to share with you. At birth, we boarded the train and met our parents. And we believed they, will, they, they would always travel on our train, on our side. However, at some station, our parents will stop, step down from the train, leaving us on this journey alone. As times go by, other people will board the train and they will be significant. That is our siblings, friends, children and even the love of our life. Many will step down and leave a personal vacuum. Others will go unnoticed. Then we don't realize they vacated their seats. This train ride will be full of joy, sorrow, fantasy, expectations, hellos, goodbyes, and farewells. Success consists of leaving a good relationship with all the passengers, requiring that we give the best of ourselves. The mystery to everyone is, we do not know at which station we ourselves will step down. So we must live in the best way, love, forgive, and offer the best of who we are. It's important to do this because when the time comes for us to step down and leave our seat empty, we should leave behind beautiful memories for those who will continue to travel for, on the train of life. Reach success and give lots of love. More importantly, thank God for the journey. Lastly, I thank you for being one of the passengers on my train, even though many of you were so only for a few hours. I wish you all the very best on your life's journey. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for inspiring words. Now I would like to call upon Professor Yara Gatti to deliver the presidential address. A very good afternoon to all the dignitaries assembled here. And very warm welcome on behalf of Institute and on behalf of uh, Professor Sapan Bhattacharya, the director. I welcome Professor T. Ramachandran, who has constantly coming to this institute when and whenever is required by his colleagues and his students. I welcome. Professor S. Brahmanyam, who is alumnus of this institute, who has readily agreed to come and give a lecture. And our senior colleagues, my teachers, I am a bit nervous in front of them. All the star words are there here. They were my teachers. I take this opportunity to welcome them also. My friends, this is a very a rare occasion and the rare type of, a unique type of system where we have this lecture series. You don't find this in any other institutes except for some higher learning institutes, but in this area. And uh, I was very much uh, 
overwhelmed by hearing that metallurgical department is the first one to start this lecture series and it's well organized and well continued also. Because other day I remember when they were breaking the front side to make a pathway for the lift, I saw an iron rod which was as new as what it was built 40 years back. We were just discussing, then uh, Professor Jagannath passed that way. I asked him, see, I think you can do, how can this not rust in the rusty areas, in the salty area? Because all other iron rods is, which are put in the reinforcement have been rusted, but that is still remaining. Then they said, no, it is all the metallurgy people, materials people have to answer that. So I asked him what is it you do the research and he said some composition and all. So that is the mystery. <laughs> and even that uh, materials used in the main building construction, because I was in charge of electrical works, they want to do some holes, drill the holes to put the wire and all. The first people who took the contracting, they were totally under losses because third or fourth hole, the iron, that bit used to break because making hole into that was more harder than making hole into a stone. Then the next year onwards, there uh, some money was given for bit one hole, four bits. That money was also given. Again I asked what is it? Again it depends on the materials. So it is the materials people, metallurgical engineering people who are the base of whole of our life. One more instant I was uh, talking to somebody like see you see this watermelon it's inside full of water but the, no water or no moisture oozes out of that skin. So we were thinking why can't the people make these roofs of that type of uh, structure. Okay the internal structure can be studied by your latest softwares but again it is the metallurgical and materials people who have to give what it is, if that type of structure has been done, there won't be any leakage or seepage of due to these heavy rains. Okay, well friends, I am very much touched when Professor Ramachandran told that about me, uh, his uh, two sons, we were all childhood friends, and his uh, daughter was my classmate, she was also alumnus here, electrical department, uh, we were uh, partners in lab also, because of she was Anita and uh, mine was you because in the, when they make the lab batches, the U and the A's used to come in one line. <laughs> so, they were really, so we also had all the uh, essence of uh, what learning process in the then KRAC. You are all lucky, uh, my colleague, I mean metallurgical department right from my younger days I am uh, seeing they are very strong and very intact. You can see any lecture or anything organized by that department, the whole department will come together. And I wish uh, the same thing should start in other departments. I think chemical department have started this lecture series. So they should take guidelines, help from metallurgical department, which is a unique structure of this lecture series. And my students, you take advantage of this lecture series. It's a very serious lecture, it's going on and on. A lot of research work is going on in metallurgy and material science engineering. So please take advantage of this and uh, use it for your research work. So I don't want to take more time. I'm really touched by Professor Ramchandran's words that he remembers me as his son's uh, friends also. And uh, I wish more and more such uh, lecture series will be organized in this institute and um, our wishes will be there. All the best. Thank you. Now I request Professor Yaragati to give a token of our appreciation to our Chief Guest Professor S. To extend our gratitude to Professor T. Ramachandran in the form of a memento.
hospital remediation. I invite Professor S. Subramanian to take over the proceedings. Good afternoon to all of you. <coughs> Professor, respected Professor Ramchandran, Professor Uday Yaragati, Professor Jagannath Nayak, past and present members of the faculty, staff, and students of the Department of Metallurgical and Materials Engineering and the Institute, distinguished invitees and guests, ladies and gentlemen. I deem it a great honor to deliver this 24th lecture in the Professor Ramchandran series, which was instituted in 1991, and the first speaker was Dr. Krishnadas Nair. Professor Ramchandran lecture series, lecture series was jointly instituted by the Department of uh, the then Metallurgy and the Metallurgical Engineering Association of the department. And in this context, I am grateful to Dr. Narayan Prabhu for extending this invitation to me. I am doubly humbled that I am given this opportunity to deliver this lecture in the august presence of Professor Ramchandran, the founding head of the department of, uh, of the then KREC and the Department of Metallurgy at the then KREC, who is indeed a true visionary and a doyen of metallurgical education and research in this country. It has already been mentioned, but it is, it is important to reiterate that the strong foundation laid by him and his other colleagues, faculty members, during the formative years has actually enabled the department to grow from strength to strength and emerge as one of the best in this country today. Professor Ramchandran's simplicity, humility, sincerity, devotion to duty and compassion will always remain green in my memory. I am beholden to him for all the support and encouragement given to me during my stay here as a research scholar. And in fact, it is exactly 38 years and one day since I first set foot in this institute. So my talk today is entitled microbially assisted processes in mental processing and environmental remediation and I wish to share with you some of the work that we have been doing in the past few years. <clears throat> so as we all know the interaction of uh, microbes with metals has important applications in the field of biohydrometallurgy that is uh, what is otherwise bioleaching and it has been commercialized for the extraction of gold, for copper, for uranium and zinc. The other application of microbes in a different context which we have started at the Indian Institute of Science about a decade ago is actually to see how you can modify the surface to make it hydrophobic or hydrophilic either with the bacterial cells or with extracellular secretions and this is something that we have been sort of pioneering this research and there is a group in the United States, the Ross Smith's group who also started some work on desulfurization of coal but none of this has been commercialized as yet. The third aspect is with respect to environmental remediation where the microbes can actually capture the metals mostly from aqueous solutions. So I will be just giving you a glimpse of the work that we have been doing here, uh, doing at the Indian Institute of Science on some of these aspects. So as I mentioned, what is important in terms of uh, the uh, environmental issues is actually the acid production potential and a serious problem of acid mine drainage. That is uh, what happens in the context of a closed mine. Uh, the same microorganisms which are beneficial for extraction, but in the context of a closed mine which is unattended, you will see that the acidity that is generated can cause a health hazard and also a pollution hazard in terms of uh, seepage into the ground waters. And this is something that is very serious, uh, seriously addressed and particularly in North America and Europe. It is not very seriously addressed in India, 
but there are issues particularly in the case of uh, sulfur containing coal mines. The other aspect is with respect to bioremediation that some of the strategies that we have uh, done to uh, basically do the remediation of acid mine water. In this context we have used different substrates both organic and inorganic. You can see that uh, we have used uh, the tree bark, then the rice husk which are the organic substrates and red mud and fly ash which are actually waste from the alumina industry and the uh, thermal plants. So what we have done is to use these waste materials and see whether they can mitigate another problem which is encountered that is the acid mine drainage. And we have used a sulphate reducing bacteria that is desulfatomyclum nigrificans for doing this uh, remediation process. We are also doing some work on the bio removal of uh, other toxic metals like uh, chromium and lead. Then lastly, what is more important is actually the development of uh, bioreagents as collectors in the flotation of sulphide minerals. I talked about the inducing hydrophobicity and that is what we'll be, uh, I, I'll be explaining to you towards the end of my lecture. <coughs> So from, for those of you who are from a different background, we all know that uh, the microorganisms which are implicated in, uh, in the context of uh, leaching are the sulfate, sul sulfur, you can say they are called acidophiles, the acidithiobacillus peroxidants, they can actually oxidize the sulfur, they can also oxidize iron. Then you have the acidithiobacillus thioxidants which can oxidize the sulfur. You have leptospirillum peroxidants, which is actually more prevalent in highly acidic environments, and the sulfur lobus, which can also oxidize iron and sulfur. You also have some neutrophilic organisms like thiobaris. They are also oxidizers of sulfur. And as you can see here, that these organisms can survive at highly acidic pH, which is actually important in the context of leaching. And uh, we also have some neutrophilic organisms and all of them are mesophiles, that is they survive at moderate temperatures. The other column here lists about their other characteristics, namely the autotrophic, that means they can get their carbon from the carbon dioxide of the atmosphere and they are gram negative, that is they do not answer the gram staining test. The gram test is an important test to distinguish between organisms which are gram positive and gram negative. So you actually classify the organisms by this test which was initially started by Christian Gram. And you can see here you have several oxidation steps that is either the iron or the sulfur and then you have the sulfur pathways from thiosulfate and ultimately to sulfate. So the work that we did for the Hutti gold mines that is uh, basically uh, putting up a demonstration uh, bioreactor plant. This uh, was actually in the context of uh, treatment of uh, sulphide bearing gold ores. As we all know that uh, gold is always occurs in the native state. So you have gold deposits in India, the, the major uh, you know, gold producing state in the country is Karnataka and the first operations were over 100 years ago started at Kolar gold fields. But the gold there is associated with the quartz, which is actually easy to extract. It is called as a free milling gold ore. But we also have deposits of gold which is, occurs within a sulphide matrix, that is pyrite and arsenopyrite. So that is the type of gold ores which you have to do a pre-oxidation step. And the bacterial leaching is actually done for this pre-oxidation. So basically it is not the gold that is dissolved but the sulphide matrix is oxidized and thereby the gold is getting liberated. So you will see here in this flask, this is the electron micrograph of the uh, acidithiobacillus peroxidans. You will see that the energy source for this uh, bacteria is uh, ferrous and it, once the bacterial cells proliferate, the ferrous is oxidized to ferric and later we will see some of the mechanisms by which this uh, leaching process proceeds. Here you have the process flow sheet that has been developed for the bioreactors. These are the three three stage bioreactors that have been uh, erected there. Basically, the 
slurry of the gold ore is taken in presence of sulfuric acid, there is a reten retention time of about 48 hours where the sulfide is oxidized to the sulfate. The context here is the pyrite and arsenopyrite. And then the leaching is done in the presence of microorganisms at acidic pH. But as we all know that uh, the gold is actually extracted only by cyanide and cyanidation process has to be done under alkaline pH. So after you get the dis dissolution of the sulfides, you actually neutralize the sulfides by using uh, lime or sodium hydroxide and then you do the cyanidation to extract the gold. So on the, at the bottom part of the graph what you see here is that the gold extraction in the absence of the oxidation, bio-oxidation process is about 40 percent whereas it's almost doubled when you do this uh, uh, pre-oxidation of the sulfides before you do the cyanidation. Similarly you have ex higher extraction of uh, silver, generally gold and silver occur together. So this has been uh, actually done, the lab scale studies were translated to a pilot bioreactor. The engineering of this was done by Engineers India Limited and we have the pilot bioreactor actually erected at the Hunty Gold Mines. Now I'll move on to some of the issues related to acid mine drainage which I talked about. So this is in the context of the Ingaldal copper mines at uh, Chittadurga which has actually been uh, closed. So what we have done is we have, uh, there is a tailing dump there which is uh, basically the flotation process you actually extract the copper and then the pyrite which is uh, of not of much use is actually dumped there in the site. So even today if you go to, happen to go to Ingaldal mines you can see these uh, dumps. So basically we have done the microbial, uh, the microbial ecology of this deposit as well as the mineralogical characterization of the tailings. We wanted to know what are the predominant minerals which can get oxidized. And then as I mentioned to you in the context of a natural dump, the presence of moisture and oxygen can, pro can result in the oxidation of pyrite and then you see that sulfuric acid is generated and the generation of sulfuric acid can bring about dissolution of the metals, in this case copper, lead, zinc, etc. So this leads to what is called as the acid mine drainage. So we wanted to look at the acid consumption potential of this uh, tailing and we did this test over a period of time in column studies and then we have also isolated the microorganisms which are present in this natural dump so we could identify uh, not only the autotrophic organisms but also the heterotrophic bacteria as well as the yeast. So you will see here this uh, This is the dump that is the, the brownish one is what is uh, presently dumped over the copper tailings. These are the, actually the processed gold tailings and uh, what you see here is which is there even today is a small uh, sort of a well where you can see that the pH of the water is around uh, close to 2 and this is due to the oxidation of pyrite. During the time of the British uh, uh, era, they were wanting to produce sulphur from this pyrite deposit and they did some workings but later it was not commercially feasible. But even today when you go there you will see that the water is highly acidic here, the pH is of the order of 2 to 2.3 and then you can see that immediately after any rain event you will see that there is acidity generated and the proliferation of the microorganisms. So we have isolated the microorganisms from here. This is what you see here is the edit that is uh, done for the extraction of copper and you can see that uh, at uh, lower levels once you go to uh, you know uh, great depths you can see that the under the groundwater can get contaminated because of the acidity generated. So what we did is, uh, this is the tailing dumps I talked about, on the top you have the gold and then we have the copper tailings uh, below that. About 25 meters of the dump we did some bore tests, we did actually the drilling, we collected samples for every meter and we analyzed the, the geochemical constituents of that and as you can see the, all these elements are present there. As can be expected because of uh, the gold being present in arsenopyrite, you have higher concentration of arsenic there. But as far as the copper tailings, you have the other elements that is copper, lead and zinc. So the, I talked about the organisms that we 
isolated, this is leptospirillum uh, for oxidants, you have the acetabacillus for oxidants, these are the electron micrographs of these organisms. We also uh, identified some yeast and the sulphate reducing bacteria. So you can see that in nature the microorganisms are not occurring individually, but there is a consortium of mycobacteria and they can actually play a part in actually the mediation of the acidity that is generated. So when we did the tests in columns, these are long term tests conducted in uh, columns, we erected columns there, we took the tailings and we carried out these studies over an extended period of time over 550 days and as you can see we have under different conditions you have the acidity getting generated. So we did some control tests in the absence of bacteria and in presence of bacteria. So fortunately for us because of the pyrite uh, to depress the pyrite lime is added in the flotation process as you all know. So the lime that is generated uh, that is uh, present there in a way acts as a buffer and uh, the acidity generated is not much that means in a two year period you can see that from about 8, 8, 8.5 we are able to come down to only about 1. So fortunately the acidity that is generated in this uh, tailing dump is not too severe and uh, this is also due to the beneficial effect of lime which is present in the tails. So when you come to remediation uh, strategies for actually effluents, that is when you talk of the acid mine water, there are several techniques that one can uh, adopt. They, are, they could be abiotic techniques which are very simple. The, as we all know to mitigate the acidity you have to add lime, so the aeration, uh, you have the anoxic uh, limestone ponds which are uh, actually added to mitigate the acidity. You can also do biological processes which can be both passive as well as active. What we have adopted in our study is to look at the role of the sulphate reducing bacteria because the, the ions which are present in the effluents are basically as their sulphates because the sulphate, sulfuric acid is converting the copper, lead and zinc into the corresponding sulphates. So we were wanting to know whether this sulphate could be uh, reduced to the sulphide using this sulphate reducing bacteria. So this is what uh, the strategy in nature, you have the sulphur cycle. So you have in, the, in terms of leaching, you need to oxidize the, the sulphide to the sulphate. But in terms of an environmental issue, when you already have a sulphate, you have to reduce it to the sulphide. And this is what we do. So we, uh, various organic uh, uh, electron donors have to be used and the sulphate uh, reducing bacteria, it uses either lactate or acetate. And uh, what we have done is, we have developed a strategy uh, wherein we produce the hydrogen sulphide. The sulphate uh, reducing bacteria basically releases hydrogen sulphide by this metabolic process. And that hydrogen sulphide which is biogenically produced is used for the pre precipitation in this case of uh, cadmium sulphide. So what you see here is the cadmium sulphide precipitate and uh, interestingly when you look at different elements, when you have multi-element solutions like cadmium zinc iron in this case, you can see that uh, the solubility product principle with respect to the sulphides is very clearly obeyed. So you can see that uh, uh, cadmium is uh, precipitated first, uh, followed by zinc and finally the iron. So if you look at the solubility product of these sulphides, they follow the same principle. So you can use this to actually do a selective precipitation. And uh, for those who are also interested in looking at nanomaterials, the sulphate, the precipitates which are produced here are all in the nano-sized uh, range. And we have seen that they are different from the uh, chemically produced uh, sulphides. As we all know, for group 2, you add the KIP separators for producing the hydrogen sulphide and we have done some characterization of these sulphides and found them to be different. Now if you look at uh, the sulphide reducing bacteria, I told you that uh, in this case we have used the desulfotomycolum nigrificans and uh, this is actually a heterotroph, it is gram negative and you can see that it requires uh, medium, that is the bars medium and uh, sodium lactate is the carbon source for its growth. 
So we have uh, tried to see whether we can substitute this uh, carbon source by other natural uh, ways. That is, we have taken here the rice husk as well as the tree bark. We have characterized the waste. And uh, when we did the, we treated the acid mine water obtained from the Chitandurga mine, we could see that we could easily get complete removal of uh, iron, both in the ferrous and phenic state, as well as uh, the concentrations of copper and zinc were below 2 ppm. And then if you correspondingly see the changes with respect to pH and the redox potential, because I told you that the sulphate reducing bacteria is an anaerobic organism, that means it does not, uh, it cannot grow in the presence of oxygen, you need reducing conditions. So we can see that the redox potential is also significantly reduced when you take uh, the extract from the rice husk and then you see that the pH which was initially 2, 2.3 is now raised to about 4.5. So then the next step was to actually uh, look about the sulphate reduction. So here again we see that uh, starts, uh, different pH values, of course the pH value, this is the neutrophilic organism, so the pH is closer to neutral pH, your chances of sulphate reduction are better, but still we wanted to know whether we can adapt this organism to low pH values, and you can see that the sulphate reduction actually takes a long time, but you can see that it is a function of pH. For those of you who are wondering why there is an increase in sulphate uh, reduction after a certain time, it's basically due to the co-precipitation of the sulphides with the iron hydroxide which is formed, that is the jarosite, and then you see that it is getting uh, released after some time. So we also did uh, some work with respect to the tree bark. Again, you find a similar trend that you have the reduction of iron, complete reduction of iron, you have copper and zinc also getting reduced to a great extent. The sulphate reduction is actually uh, better compared to the bars control medium when we use the extract from, in this case, from the tree bark. So these are, uh, another important thing is with respect to the pH, again you will find that you are able to increase the pH in presence of these reagents. So we also looked at some inorganic base, in this case uh, fly ash. Uh, the advantage of the fly ash is that you can see that by treating the acid mine water with the fly ash extract, you can actually increase the pH which is going to be more effective when you use the sulphate reducing bacteria. And uh, correspondingly the redox potential also there is a decrease. You will see complete removal of iron as we saw in the case of the organic substrates and then sulphate reduction is to, uh, to the extent of about 50%. So this can be further improved when you add the sulphate reducing uh, bacteria, desulfutomaculum nigrificans. Again, we see that about 60% sulphate could be reduced as a function of uh, pH. The next substrate again is the red mud because it is obtained by the caustic digestion of bauxite, so it is naturally alkaline. So you will see that you can use it to advantage to increase the pH to about 77.5. Here again you will find that the removal of these metals are almost complete, but the sulphate reduction is only of the order of 20%. But once you add this uh, diesel photomaculum nigrificans uh, after neutralizing the acid mine water, you will be able to get a better reduction of the sulphate. So the mechanisms involved with respect to the various substrates that we have used, I talked about the carboxyl group and the phenolic groups that are present can bind with the metals. In the case of the desulfotomaculum nigrificans, the sulphate is actually reduced to hydrogen sulphide. And this hydrogen sulphide which is biogenically produced can be used for the precipitation of the sulphides as the corresponding sulphides. Now, we will go on to the bioremediation studies that we have done for uh, lead and uh, copper, uh, lead and chromium. So here what you see here is a different organism. This is actually a Pseudomonas species. This is uh, also found in typical effluents. It is also found in soils. This is a neutrophilic organism. This is not an acidophile. So we have seen that in a controlled experiment as a function of pH, if you look at the stability of, uh, in this case, uh, lead, you will see that uh, the lead is uh, quite stable or uh, up to pH 6, but in the presence of the organism, you are able to capture the lead and almost 100% uh, 
bioabsorption of red takes place. <coughs> if you see the kinetics, you can see that it follows the pseudo second order kinetics. Again, one can do these tests to establish uh, basic parameters for uh, scale up. If you look at the biomass loading, you can see that as you increase the biomass, you will be able to have better capture of the metals. This is to be expected and almost complete uh, removal of lead could be achieved. What is important also is to look at the biosorption isotherm. So you can see that it follows the typical Langmuirian behavior. The free energy is uh, of the order of minus 30 kilojoules per mole. Again, the reaction is quite favorable. And then you can use this data for building up the, uh, the parameters for the scale-up. We also did some work on the use of this as a, for electrochemical studies. I'll come to that a little later. But what you see here is the mechanisms of the bacterial addition to the metal ions. You have various, in the bacterial cell wall, you have various uh, lipids, which have some functional groups like the carboxyl group. You have the phosphate. These are potential sites for binding the metal. And the ionization of phosphate, as we all know, is again as a function of pH. If you want complete ionization, you have to go to higher pH values, as you can see here. So as I talked about, uh, we did a novel electrode. A carbon-based electrode was uh, modified using this uh, microorganisms. So we have a typical three electrode assembly here. And we are able to use this as a technique for remediation. You can see the cyclic voltammetric tests that have been done. Uh, this uh, you can see that of the order of 10 power minus, minus 5, you will be able to uh, detect. And uh, once you use the differential pulse aldotic stripping volta voltammetry, you can go to uh, still lower concentrations. So this is something that we have done where you can actually do the capture of the metal ions from the effluent which is actually taken as the electrolyte onto the cells, onto the electrode surface which is a modified biomass loaded carbon based electrode. Uh, in the context of uh, the chromium remediation, uh, there is a mine in the Hassan district which is called as the Bakterhalli mines. So we actually isolated these organisms from this mine site. We collected the water samples and using standard microbiological protocols. And these are the organisms that we could identify uh, from this uh, mine site. You can see that again the biosorption of chromium is quite good here. We can go even up to about nearly 100% removal for a given type of a microorganism. These are different microorganisms natural microorganisms isolated from the mine. Uh, you have the standard protocols like the pore plate technique and stick plate technique uh, which one can use to identify these uh, microorganisms. And then you do a 16S RNA uh, sequencing to identify uh, which microorganism you are dealing with. All these protocols were followed. What is interesting in the case of chromium is the two valency state that it exists. We all know that hexavalent chromium is more toxic compared to the trivalent chromium. So we wanted to know the, the actually the remediation mechanism adopted by the microorganism. So we did some X-ray photoelectron uh, spectroscopic studies and uh, we could I identify not only the chromium-6 but also chromium-3. And uh, you can see here that uh, the binding sites for the microorganism with respect to the chromium are both again the carboxyl group and the hydroxyl groups where the, you see there is a binding energy shifts after this interaction with these metal ions, indicating they are involved in the, in the, in the coordination or chelation of these uh, metals. <coughs> the last part of my talk is uh, dealing with the bioreagents as uh, flotation collectors. So this is what I was talking about uh, in the context of use of these microorganisms for a different purpose. It is not for extraction, but for inducing surface hydrophobicity onto the minerals. So we have done a lot of work on the spalerite galena, that is the lead zinc core. 
So just to give you a background, the bacterial cell surface is actually in this case a, a gram-positive organism that is the bacillus species. You can see the cell wall architecture, you have a 